Okay, I think we'll start if that's all right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Liz Darlison. I'm CEO at Mesothelioma UK and also a consultant nurse at the University Hospitals of Leicester. Welcome to this. This is our third Mesothelioma Matters webinar. And um, I'm delighted to welcome today Professor Kevin Blythe and Dr. Paul Beckett. And I'll introduce them a little bit more in just a moment. The whole subject area for today is about multidisciplinary team working about the importance of that in cancer care, where we're at in mesothelioma. And then um, hopefully we're gonna see a shining example because Kevin's gonna talk us through what they've achieved um, across Scotland with their multidisciplinary team working. So our next webinar will be on Monday the 29th of March. And we are moving the time of that one forward because our presenter that day is um, Anna Nowak, who's a, a medical oncologist from Western Australia. So, so to fit in with her timelines and not make it too late in the evening for her, we've moved that forward to lunchtime on Monday the 29th. So if I can just ask people, um, if you are joining us, can I please ask you to make sure that you're muted? Um, we have got Faye and Julie in the background who will be um, prowling over people's uh, logons just to make sure you're muted and also leave your cameras off. And please also, if you have any questions, will you put those into the, um, into the chat facility? Um, and we're going to um, have both presentations and then I will be um, posing any questions that you've asked uh, to Kevin and Paul at the end. So please do keep the questions coming. Um, because, um, you know, that's always the, the liveliest bit of, of the discussion is often the chat at the end. Um, so with that, I'm going to formally introduce Professor uh, Kevin Blythe. He's a Professor of Respiratory Medicine at the University of Glasgow. He's the founder and director of the Scottish Mesothelioma Network that um, is funded by Macmillan Cancer Support and, um, and Meso UK. We also help and there are also uh, other funders, Clydeside, um, Action Asbestos, I believe. Um, Kevin also leads um, a translational research programme focused on plural disease. So Kevin's going to follow Dr. Paul Beckett. Paul Beckett is a consultant respiratory physician at the Derby and Burton NHS Trusts. He was for over 10 years the clinical lead for the National Lung Cancer and Mesothelioma Audit, um, which is where I've had the pleasure of working with him. Um, and he is currently the clinical lead for the um, National Health Initiative, Getting It Right First Time, and that's the lung cancer arm of that programme. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Paul and um, ahead of your presentations, thank you very much. Thank you. Kevin, do you want to put your camera on? Thanks, well? Liz. So I'm just going to share my screen. And hopefully you can all see my uh, my slides now. So um, thank you very much, Liz, and uh, Mesothelioma UK for asking me to uh, talk about uh, Mesothelioma MDT for this webinar today. Um, so I want to start just by looking at, at the history of cancer MDTs. These, these forums have existed for discussing cancer cases for many, many years, actually. Uh, in different forms uh, in different countries of the world. And when they were first set up, the initial focus really was on, on, a, on, on what, what we might consider now to be secondary functions of an MDT, which were around networking and keeping up to date with, with new developments. And, and, and it was only a, a sort of small part of their function to act in, as an advisory uh, panel for uh, complex or difficult cases. <clears throat> But in the UK, there was a step change in how cancer patients were managed following the Kalman Hine report from 1995. And this report came out um, in response to findings that uh, outcomes for cancer patients in the UK were poor compared to um, other similar healthcare systems. And then, uh, amongst all of the recommendations in that report was was a move towards cancer patients being managed by a multidisciplinary team rather than an individual. And the cornerstone of that, um, that arrangement was a, a weekly MDT meeting uh, where uh, issues around diagnostics and treatment would be discussed. Um, 
and agreed, although the ultimate decision around management education would, would later be made between the treaty commission and patients. And, and over the years since 1995, MBT, cancer MBT have become widely established. And uh, we know that in the lung cancer area, by around 2010, pretty much all patients were uh, being discussed at some point uh, in an MBT meeting. Um, so what, what are the characteristics of an MDT that we would want to see? Well, in, in 2012, the UK Lung Cancer Coalition um, commissioned a report to look at what they would consider, um, uh, what a patient might consider that they would want from their, from their MDT. And they call this the dream MDT. So they put quite a lot of stuff in here, which we'll just go through quickly. So really you want a, a team that, um, is properly constituted, has the appropriate level of expertise and specialization, that the, the members of the team attend the meetings, um, and that there's a strong um, uh, proactive leadership and a good culture of uh, excellence and improvement within, within the team. You want to make sure that the team has appropriate infrastructure and logistics, so the meeting room has to be prepared, as does the IT and other equipment. The meetings have to occur with um, adequate regularity. There needs to be time for preparation for the meeting to get the most out of it. And the, the meeting itself has to be properly organized and minuted and uh, mechanisms put in place to, um, uh, to uh, ensure that the, 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 the actions that come out of the meeting um, can be enacted uh, rapidly and efficiently. There's a whole thing then around the, 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 the decision making that, that uh, takes place, what, what we would call clinical decision making, which is a little bit more difficult to define and a little bit more difficult to, to measure, but I'll, I'll mention that on the, on the, on the next slide. And then it, there's an important role uh, in the team for uh, governance arrangements. <clears throat> so for example, um, uh, organizational support, ensuring that data is collected, analyzed, audited and used to support learning and development, that the team is able to um, consider and refer patients on to clinical trials, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the sort of thing that we would want to see from a, from a, a, a really good MDT, things that we would expect um, to uh, lead to an MDT functioning effectively. Um, and this is, the, this is the sort of thing we mean when we talk about MDT culture and clinical decision making. So the team really needs to have a, a common sense of purpose and a clear understanding of the object, of objectives that they're aiming to achieve from the meeting. All the members have to be uh, valued and have mutual respect and trust amongst them all. And there has to be a willingness for all members to be able to speak openly. And we want a, a team that uh, has a range of skills and a range of personal styles that we can reach. Mm -hmm. And if we think about um, uh, an MDT such as, such as we've described, a dream MDT, you might, you might imagine that it's obviously going to be advantageous for, uh, for uh, delivery of care, but not necessarily. And um, David Baldwin and Helen Powell in Nottingham have, have uh, written a, a review of the subject. So they've looked at, at, at some of the advantages and disadvantages of, of MDT um, work in cancer care. And, so if we look at the, the advantages, we, we can imagine that, that patients might uh, have more guideline important treatment. They might be more likely to have any treatment at all, actually, if they discuss an MDT. The MDT arrangements might speed up the process from diagnosis to treatment. Certainly, if you have a, a, a meeting that's carved out of the diary, it, it might enable more time, protected time, for complex patients to be discussed. It's helpful from a medical legal standpoint, so that where, where a patient's care doesn't sit neatly in, into a guideline, um, the, the, the backup of colleagues can, can help from a medical legal standpoint, guideline care is not being delivered. Uh, as I've mentioned earlier, the MDT meeting offers an opportunity for education, keeping up to date with new developments. It may increase um, entry of patients into clinical trials, and by, by a collection of data enables uh, monitoring of performance and can drive improvements of care. 
um, it can flag up good practice where good practice exists and can be an early signal of uh, less good performance of that screen. But there are also potential disadvantages to MBT working. Perhaps the most important one, uh, the one that I see the most of, is the potential for de-skilling through an over-reliance on MBT for any decisions at all. And we'll, we'll cover that in a later slide. The MBT model of care also drags in a lot of uh, financial cost and clinical time. Again, we'll mention, mention that in a later slide. And finally, there is the potential for MBT to actually slow down the process of diagnosis and treatment. If you have to wait till the following week for an MBT to take place before you can make, make the next decision, perhaps at that meeting, some information is not available or the important person to make the decision is not in the meeting, that can definitely slow down care. So what is the evidence that cancer MBTs are effective in improving cancer care for patients? Well, actually, there isn't really very much evidence at all. Uh, what, what evidence there is, 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 is mostly small and controlled studies. So we have to rely on some systematic reviews and uh, a systematic review carried out in 2008, specifically in lung cancer, uh, concluded that there was no high quality uh, prospective evidence that cancer MDTs led to improvement in survival of patients. A further study, um, a further systematic review carried out in 2014 looked at 29 studies across a range of cancers and did conclude actually that uh, discussion in the multidisciplinary setting did improve certain patient outcomes. It improved um, uh, diagnosis uh, and treatment planning. It led to better patient and clinician satisfaction. And it also concluded that there was some evidence to improve survival. Although if you look at the study that, that, that um, led to that conclusion, it was uh, uh, not the most rigorous study that you can uh, imagine being carried out. So I think that the jury's out on the survival side of things. Um, and there are actually a number of tools that can be used, uh, validated tools, to determine whether an MBT is uh, functioning well. Um, uh, but I think these, these, these instruments tend to be used more in a research setting rather than actually using the practical sense to try and um, uh, improve the functioning of actual clinical MDT. Unfortunately, uh, despite all the potential benefits of MDT, there is quite significant evidence that MDTs may not be meeting patients' needs. So the best uh, evidence we have from this is from this Cancer Research UK um, investigation that was done about uh, four or five years ago. <clears throat> and to, to sort of summarize the findings of this, um, they found that um, uh, cancer MDTs had four main problems. First was that it was inadequate time to discuss complex cases that needed the time. Second, that attendance at MDTs by the relevant specialist was not optimal. Thirdly, that appropriate information was often not used in discussions. So either the information was not available or when it was available, it wasn't used appropriately. And fourthly, MDTs were not resourced adequately to be able to carry out the, the second, secondary role of things like governance, um, learning, um, monitoring of performance, etc. So why, why is that? Why, why, are, why are MDTs not meeting patients' needs? Well, I think, one of the reasons for this is that um, um, we're, we're trying to squeeze too much into MDTs. So if you look at the graph on the right, it's taken from the same Cancer Research UK uh, report, and you can see that the, the enormous increase over, over three or four years in the number of MDT discussions that take place on patients. And if you can then compare that to the increase in the level of staffing for those MDTs, you can see that there's increasingly an mismatch. We know from the National Lung Cancer Audit that um, uh, uh, MDTs can be two, three, or sometimes more than three hours long with up to 70, 70 patients discussed in, a, in an individual MDT. And you can imagine that you would much prefer to be the first patient discussed in such a meeting 
rather than the last one. And there was a comment here from the Cancer Research UK report. Far too many routine decisions are made at MDC meetings where intelligent, highly trained professionals have now been trained to be unable to make a decision. I think we need to make sure that we use MDC appropriately. And then finally, um, there's evidence that MDT decisions are maybe not as patient-centered as they should be. So this is taken from the Cancer Research UK um, report. Uh, and patients were asked whether they felt they'd had enough opportunity to contribute to the discussion about their case at the MDT meeting. And sadly, nearly 70% of patients disagreed or strongly disagreed that they were able to contribute to the discussion. So I think hopefully that sets the scene for um, why we have cancer MDTs, why they uh, should benefit patient care, and perhaps sometimes why they don't benefit patient care. So what do we know specifically about mesothelioma MDTs? So this slide um, tells us a little bit about the, um, the caseload for individual hospitals looking after patients with mesothelioma. So you can see from this that, uh, so this is data taken from the National Mesothelioma Audit. Uh, this, this is data collected from the years 2016 to 2018. But if you, if you, if you look at each individual year, how many, how many new patients with mesothelioma an individual hospital might see, then you can see the numbers are actually relatively small. There's a handful of patients at the, at the end there who is seeing maybe 35 to 40 cases per year. But, but probably more than half of, of hospitals are seeing less than 15 cases. So it becomes very difficult to um, develop the, the, the expertise um, and experience of managing a, a, a less common condition when the numbers are so small. And really as a result of that, as a result of those small numbers, in 2013, NHS England produced some commissioning guidance which recommended the establishment of specialist mesothelioma MDTs. It's similar to uh, the specialist MDTs that have been established for some other rarer cancers like penile cancer or, or germ cell tumors. They recommended in that commissioning guidance that the specialist mesothelioma MDT should manage a minimum of 25 patients per year. So over the years since then, there has there has certainly been a move towards uh, implementing these in, in different areas of the country and in different ways. This is one of the first uh, published reports of the, um, of the impact of uh, a regional uh, specialist mesothelioma MDT. And this is, this is produced by the group from Bristol who, who implemented a regional MDT they reported their experience over, um, over, uh, over a couple of years. Um, and they, they, they found that they were, they were able to discuss a lot of cases. So they discussed 170 cases, so well, well above the, 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 the 50 that you might expect over the year period. Um, they were able to confirm the, the diagnosis in 73% of patients. And in, 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 in many of the other patients, they were able to actually exclude the diagnosis and come to a different diagnosis. They were able to provide uh, good treatment advice and they had a really, really good rate of recruiting for clinical trials. And despite all of that, uh, they uh, had a fast and efficient process. So in 75% of the cases, the overall process took from referral to a final outcome took less than two weeks. And now, of course, we have national guidelines uh, these are the guidelines for the BTS, which is Thoracic Society Guidelines for the Investigation of Management of, of Malignant Pleural Mesothelioma, which were published in 2018. And um, there's a section in these guidelines around multidisciplinary work. And first of all, they make an evidence statement. The evidence statement is relatively weak because the evidence is weak. So they say that specialist malignant pleural mesothelioma MDT meetings may improve diagnostic accuracy and recruitment to clinical trials. And so their main recommendation is that clinicians should consider referring cases to a regional mesothelioma MDT. 
they also highlight three good practice points. The first is that all mesothelioma cases should be discussed in a timely fashion by an MDT that has uh, adequate caseload to maintain expertise and competence. Secondly, that the MDT membership should be adequate and that expected through national peer review mechanisms. And thirdly, that the MDT should maintain an up-to-date portfolio of clinical trials and offer recruitment to clinical trials for all patients. So Mesothelioma UK were interested, um, well, so Mesothelioma UK and the Royal College Physicians have worked for a number of years now on the National Mesothelioma Audit. And um, we, were, we were all interested to know how, how uh, the organization of services was and how far uh, services had come in implementing these recommendations around specialist mesothelioma and MDTs. So towards the end of 2018 and uh, into 2019, um, Meso UK commissioned this mesothelioma organization audit. And this was run in two phases. And the first phase involved an online survey, which was sent out to all hospital lung cancer MDTs. And that was across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And we received responses from 72 percent of the, of the 174 hospitals that we identified that looked after um, patients with thoracic malignancy. <clears throat> and as part of that survey, um, the, the teams were asked um, whether they referred their patients on to some sort of regional or specialist musically on the MDT. So that enabled us then to move into a second phase, which focused on these um, specialist MDTs that had been identified in phase one. And uh, one of my colleagues uh, carried out, uh, first of all, uh, uh, an additional questionnaire to these, these uh, specialist MDTs, and then a 30 to 60 minute telephone call to check the accuracy of the data and gather some more quantitative and qualitative information. So if you're interested in reading this report, it's, it's, it's online on the Royal College of Physicians and the National Lung Cancer Audit website. So um, this is basically the results of, of the phase one. So um, we had responses from 105 uh, lung cancer entities in England, seven in Scotland, four in Northern Ireland, and nine in Wales. And the little graphic on the right um, tells us several important things. The first is that pretty much all patients with mesothelioma are discussed in a local MDT, in the local hospital, where they first presented and were diagnosed. But only just, just short of 17% of those local MDTs are mesothelioma specific. So the mesothelioma patients that are discussed in the local MDT are mixed up with uh, all the other thoracic malignancies that have been discussed. However, um, round about half of those local MDTs will refer patients to a regional specialist MDT. So it depends whether you're a glass half full or glass half empty sort of person. You might feel that 50% being referred on is pretty good, uh, although you, you may take completely the opposite view and say that's too poor. What I would say is that of those that did refer patients to a regional specialist MDT, not all um, hospitals would refer all of their patients. They might just refer um, a, a portion of those patients for specific reasons. So this graph here, this this uh, this little graphic of the, uh, of the of the UK map shows where those regional specialist MDTs are. We identify seventeen. There's an eighteenth actually, which is the the Basingstoke North Hampshire Hospital which provides the national peritoneal mesothelium MDT. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to talk at all about peritoneal mesothelium today because it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's, a, it's a different issue, really. So, um, so you can see where, where these are scattered around the country. There's one in uh, Wales and Cardiff, one in Scotland and Glasgow, which we'll hear about later, and uh, a bunch of others uh, spread around England. And so we asked these specialist mesothelioma MDTs, how did they 
um, how did they uh, structure the discussion of the mesothelioma patients in relation to their existing lung cancer MDTs? And what you can see from that little donut graph is that about half of the specialist mesothelial MDTs discuss the patients either at the beginning or at the end of the existing lung cancer MDT. Um, uh, about 25% of those specialist mesothelioma MDTs discuss the cases just scattered through their lung cancer MDT, and about 25% have a completely separate mesothelioma MDT at a separate time. So this is a really busy slide, and um, you're certainly not meant to read it all, but I just want to show it so I can highlight how the setup of all of the different regional MDTs um, is, is just that little bit different everywhere. So you've got some organizations that have a regional scope. Um, so for example, Royal Devon and Ex Exeter will um, just provide service to that region of the country, whereas Glenfield Hospital in Leicester uh, take referrals from, from uh, all around the country. Some uh, mesothelial entities are led by respiratory physicians, some by oncologists, also radiologist surgeons, and uh, in Birmingham, a mesothelium specialist nurse in the um, some, In some, the, uh, the uh, MDT lead is the same as the lung cancer lead, but others are different. The numbers of patients that are discussed vary very widely, from, a, from as low as 25. You had to have 25 per year to be classified as a specialist mesothelium MDT, all the way up to as much as 200. And some MDTs running um, weekly, but other MDTs not running it anywhere near so frequently, um, down to monthly, for example, for Oxford. As you might expect, the numbers of patients discussed at each meeting uh, varies quite a lot. Uh, some patients, some MDTs discussing two, three, four, five uh, at a meeting, other uh, MDTs up to 20. So we were able to extract some information about, about some benefits of specialist mesothelial MDTs from the data. So we know that um, if your case is discussed at a, a specialist meeting, you're, you're, the, the patient is more likely to have a clinical stage and histological subtype recorded. Um, patients were more likely to have support from a mesothelial specialist nurse and they appear to be more opportunity to, to participate in clinical trials. Um, the other thing is that all the specialist MDTs had established pathways for, for onward referral to patients for, for, for example, surgery or, or um, specific palliative care interventions. You can see on the right that the, the, the individual MDTs were asked to, to tell us about their strengths and weaknesses. And one of the biggest strengths that uh, they felt they had with this from the students of clinical trials. So this led uh, in the um, organizational audit report to a number of recommendations, which are listed here, uh, that every healthcare region should, should ensure that patients have access to a specialist mesothelioma MDT, that these MDTs should consider using teleconferencing uh, to ensure that uh, key members can attend and to support the the uh, integration of the peripheral hospitals. There should be clear referral pathways, including referral pro forma, and that uh, the MDT should uh, look at their provision of palliative care support, because that's very important. In the, um, and finally, uh, the MDT should record patient referrals to clinical trials and trial information. So my last slide, I just want to summarize by saying that cancer MDTs are now an established cornerstone of cancer. The, the actual scientific evidence for their effectiveness is actually quite limited, but I think most people would agree it's likely to be significant and they are definitely here to stay. However, we need to make sure that we adequately resource the MDTs and then manage in such a way that they can function as effectively as possible. And finally, mesothelioma as a, as a, a, a less common cancer does warrant a regional approach to, um, uh, to maintain expertise and experience. But although 
we seem to have started on the journey towards that. It does remain significant unwanted variation um, in access to those MDTs and in the approach of each individual MDT. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Paul. We're going to move straight over to Kevin. Um, so if Kevin would like to join us and um, share his screen, we're going to hear about um, Kevin's experience of leading the team in Scotland with the development of their national MDT. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, thanks, Les. Uh, hi to everyone. Uh, and thanks, Paul, for that um, excellent kind of review of the MDT um, process. So what I was going to do is, as Les says, just try and give you a, an overview of our experience in Scotland. Um, the Okay, so I'm going to try and just give you a very brief background to Meso in Scotland and really how our network has, has come about, the development process. I think that is kind of useful for, for you to hear about, um, just because you know, I think some of what we've learned um, can be uh, uh, deployed in other places. Um, I'll kind of walk you through some of our processes and, and some activity. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about audit and quality assurance. Um, the, we do other things than just the MDT. Um, we are a network, we are a kind of integrated service. And so I'll touch on some of the education. It's best use the arrow at the bottom of the presentation, perhaps, Kevin. Yeah, no, I've got it. Don't worry, Liz. Yeah. Uh, and then I'll finish just with some some progresses, a progress update on, on what we see as our challenges. So um, in Scotland, we have about 200 cases a year. Um, the distribution of disease is really much like the rest of the UK. Um, we have um, high incidence in our ex-industrial areas, particularly around the West uh, and the Clyde Estuary. Uh, and the rest of the, the disease is distributed across the, the South, East and the North. Uh, Scotland is obviously quite a, a mixed uh, geographical area, you know, a mixture of, of urban and rural areas. Uh, socioeconomic gradients are quite steep in Scotland. So, um, Patients at the lower end of that um, deprivation gradient uh, tend to have lower access to, to healthcare and, and, and poorer outcomes. Um, our, I guess our demographic is changing a bit, um, much like everybody else's. The images at the top here are obviously shipbuilding, which has been our, uh, for many decades, the main source of meso. The image on the left actually is Greenock, which is where I was where I was born and where I grew up and where my family all still live. In fact, my mother's house is now at the bottom here and it's now a kind of uh, one of these warehouse apartments that's been made out of an old shipyard. Uh, and the image on the right is, is actually the red circle is the Southern General. Um, this is taken in 1940 from a reconnaissance aircraft, but during the war, but that is now the site of the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, which is where I now work. And you can see there are three shipyards within a mile of, of the hospital. Um, we've kind of, we're seeing much more in, in, in the way of environmental exposure uh, in patients who are no, not shipbuilders or uh, involved in heavy industry, although those patients still exist. Um, so just to, to kind of to start back where we came from, so, so Maybe five years ago, um, we had a situation where MISO was very much at the back of a very long queue. Um, in Scotland, um, only the large cancers are, are tracked, uh, and so rare cancers are, are not subject to cancer waiting times um, monitoring. Uh, there wasn't any specific cancer audit around MISO. Uh, and what that means is there's therefore no priority, no incentive to, for health boards to prioritise services. Uh, and really over about a 10 year period, and I'll, I'll kind of walk you through this quickly. Um, there are various key steps here in, in getting to what is now a national service. Um, we started out with, with essentially a, a thoracoscopy and a plural disease service at the Southern General, which I started about 11 years ago. And we then moved to an unfunded regional MDT. Uh, we got 
a little bit of research off the ground. Uh, we got a fellow, I then reached out to Liz in about 2015 and we got our first uh, CNS, it was Jan Devlin, which some of you will remember. Um, and then a very important thing happened and probably the most important thing happened. And that was that we started to get really engaged with our patients. And it was actually the acknowledgement of variation which triggered patient engagement. Uh, it, it was patients in other parts of Scotland that weren't served by the regional MDT in the West uh, that started speaking to their MPs. And uh, some of you will know Julie Roberts' story. And Julie contacted Kezia Dugdale, who was head of the Labour Party in Scotland at the time. And we had a, a roundtable discussion in Holyrood and we had a members debate in the parliament. Uh, and then over the next two years, we then were able to pull together key stakeholders, both clinicians and patients and uh, potential funders, uh, including Miso UK, but also Macmillan, um, which uh, ended in 2018 with the submission of a partnership application for a, a national network. Uh, and that was funded uh, in 2018. And then we launched the network in 2019 on my daughter's birthday, which wasn't intentional, but it means I can't forget it uh, easily anymore. Um, the other thing in 2019 that was really important is that we, we uh, managed to get agreement to define mesothelioma QPI, which are quality performance indicators. And QPI are essentially standards that health boards in Scotland are judged against, and they really need to deliver on those things. Uh, and, so, and of course, that's important because it gives, it gives that incentive to develop services, which you really need in parallel with these other steps. So this is the, this is the structure of the current network um, in terms of, of staff that are funded. And so we fund, it's essentially a hub and spoke model. Uh, the Glasgow hub um, is the base the host centre for the National MDT, which runs every week. We have nurse specialists in, in all of the major cities. Uh, we have a clinical lead in the major cities and they are given, a, they are funded a session of time. Um, and both, both of those key staff, along with some admin support at those sites, allow engagement with the MDT, but they, they are also tasked with developing services for MISO and particularly its services uh, around the plural diagnostic pathway and IPCs and uh, a route out to colleagues in terms of MDT outcomes and, and clinical trial engagement. Um, we also have a national MDT coordinator in Glasgow and we have project management in Glasgow um, and uh, that is all supported by a three-year um, budget of just over a million pounds uh, and our, our key supporters are here and our thanks again go to those those funders. The MDT in terms of its, its structure really started pre-COVID whenever that was um, as a kind of VC MDT where we everybody dialed in and we had a kind of Glasgow um, team that, that met physically We've now moved on to Teams, and I personally think it's it's better. Uh, we it's we get um, easier connections, more people dialing in, uh, and, it, and it seems to work really well. Um, in terms of our referral um, paperwork, if you like, it's electronic, obviously. Um, this is really important. It's quite dry, but it's really important that the information that is discussed at the MDT is accurate and is up to date. And ideally you try and bring the patient in some sense to the MDT, which is where the staff come from. So the, the, the referring teams are asked to fill in the, the sections in white, um, and then we will fill in essentially the, the sections in gray. Um, uh, we've got a deadline for submission. Uh, so in general, we want to see forms in on the Wednesday before the MDT on the Friday. And we will kind of occasionally have late submissions, but only with the consent of our pathologist and our radiologist, because they need to do a prep, uh, really to Paul's point, if there isn't 
if it isn't, there isn't some prep involved, it's really not a functional discussion. Uh, this form is available um, via the RCP website that uh, Paul referenced, so you can download that form. Um, the, what, what sites would then get back is an MDT outcome form. Now, this is a dummy patient. This is Joe Blog, so there's no patient identifiable information here, but um, this is the sort of feedback that they'll get. So it will be um, staging filled out. There will be um, some key metrics, including some elements that actually constitute QPIs, things like histological subtype, appropriate pathology, um, panel being um, used. Um, if they presented with a symptomatic effusion, have they had definitive management? Um, the patient's understanding, um, it, it needs to be recorded by the team that are referring in and a question needs to be posed. And then we'll feed back um, some comments. And um, for example, here we're, uh, this is a kind of reasonably common discussion where we're recording the stage, but we're explaining why the stage is, is for example, T3 with mediastinal fat invasion. Um, we, all, we tend to always comment on technical resectability because that's really important and now increasingly important for our treatment pathways. Uh, uh, we, um, it's really important that, and we've learned this uh, over the last year, is that all the members of the MDT can actually see the, the outcome and they can edit it if they disagree with it. So we actually share this form on Teams after the imaging has been shared um, and it's typed up live and, and members of the team can edit or disagree. The language is really important here. Um, you know, it, it is about um, defining options uh, and remembering of, that the final decision remains with the local clinician and the patient. Uh, and so that language is really, really important. And we haven't always got that right. And um, there was definitely learning to be had there. Um, and we tend to offer things like video consultations with our surgeon who tends to be in Glasgow. Um, so if somebody's in Inverness and they want to have a chat about what surgery might involve, then we will arrange a VC. Um, and then that form is uh, emailed to the referring clinician and the lead and the CNS, if that's appropriate, um, in uh, that afternoon. Um, the other thing that we also put on the form is, is we will specify any trials we think the patient might be eligible for. And we also um, provide the email address of the PI so that um, just to cut down barriers to, to, to getting patients uh, engaged with trials. So this is activity that's not quite out of date. Um, it's kind of our first years of activity really, but it just to give you a flavor of, of, of the kind of cadence and, and volume of, of discussions. So um, here in, that, in this year, we discussed um, 220 odd patients from 25 different hospitals, vast majority male, typical age, asbestos exposure in only 63%. I think that talks to the increasing numbers of patients who, who, do, who are unaware of an occupational exposure um, and 181 patients diagnosed with measles. And really, this is just replicates the Bristol experience. You know, we don't just discuss patients with measles. If, if, some, if there's an uncertainty, maybe it's a sarcomatoid tumour, is it carcinoma, is it measles? Or maybe it's an early stage question, is it benign pleurisy or is it measles? We would happily discuss those cases. Um, we record, obviously, the, the methods of, of, of surgical biopsy. LAT is highlighted here because in Scotland we only have one surgical centre um, which does any volume of mesothelioma work um, and so it's important that we try and increase the numbers that, of centres that can offer local anaesthetic thoracoscopy just to try and avoid patients having to travel for um, uh, diagnostics. Um, we, we've over the last few years, use an increasing number of ancillary tests in pathology. BAP1 is now routine. P16 FISH is only used now if, if MTAP IHC is, is not useful. Um, MTAP is a correlate of P16. 
uh, loss. Um, and staging, you know, most patients are, are early stage and we should always remember that about meso. Um, and we're very happy to discuss peritoneal cases. Um, quite often it's, it's a case of confirming the diagnosis and supporting the packaging off of all the information down to Basingstoke in younger, fitter patients, uh, or it may be just uh, uh, a simpler outcome than that. And we always have, we all, we're palliative care, part of our core membership uh, and tend to be there most of the time. So um, I'm not going to get into this in a lot of detail, but it's just to make the point that um, we do have a, a kind of staging approach to the MDT that is important. Um, there clearly during the Mars 2 era, um, the question of technical resectability was essential because uh, defining technical resectability meant the patient was eligible for the Mars 2. Um, and we had an out, we've developed an algorithm essentially involving PET to confirm the disease is confined to the ipsilateral pleura. And we will also use MR if there's a suspicion of T4 disease. So that's disease through the diaphragm or multifocal chest wall invasion. And only if um, you're passing all these steps are we considering radical therapy. Um, any other outcome is going to um, direct the patient towards uh, systemic therapy uh, and trials. And that will continue to be the case, almost certainly with combination immunotherapy, where um, uh, it's reasonably likely that the, the eligibility may be technically a resectable disease, uh, because that's certainly the population that was in the Lancet paper. And it's certainly the population that's described in the current BMS EMS early access um, program for uh, Lippy Evo. We did, we did also direct patients towards mesotrap when that was open, but obviously that's closed now. Um, we, we, we make no bones about our um, clinical trial recruitment being a really key metric. Um, the studies, we've got a very wide portfolio of, of studies. Um, obviously, the, many of these studies have actually uh, closed now. I've actually had to update this slide just in the last few months. Um, but obviously with Checkmate 743, which is summarized in the slide, the, the little um, graphic at the bottom left, uh, where we've, that study has demonstrated the benefit of combination immunotherapy. And obviously the confirmed study also showing um, a survival benefit for second line uh, nivolumab, then really the, the, the task now is to, to implement these. Um, we, um, we record, obviously, we have a QPI around um, clinical trial access and, and uh, clinical trial um, recruitment. And so we recruited about 13% of all, patient, all patients to, to trials. That number is almost certainly uh, an error. Uh, and the, the, the actual number is more like 35%, but the getting trial data into a clinical system is quite difficult. Um, I was just going to touch briefly on audit and QA, and um, historically there hasn't been any patient level data from Scotland in the National Mesothelioma Audit. We've really only been able to send summary data, but with the infrastructure we now have, then uh, that will change as of the next round of audit. Um, I think the other element of, of QA that maybe we should think about is, is MDT peer review um, and QA to, to check that we're doing what we say we do. Um, but that can maybe come up perhaps in the discussion. Um, the other thing that I mentioned around, call, around QA was, was QPI, so quality performance indicators. So these are a Scottish metric, which I don't think exists elsewhere in the UK. Um, and they are, as I said, they are the, the metrics against which boards are judged and need to deliver. Um, and so it was really critical that we got these um, uh, agreed. And so these were published and agreed uh, now two years ago. Uh, we have eight QPI, and I'm not going to get into these in any detail at all. Um, but they are there for you to see. Uh, they are available online. 
um, and they cover things like the adequacy of the staging CT scan in terms of the contrast that was used, the adequacy of the histopathological assessment and uh, subtyping. Uh, patients need to be discussed at the national NDT. Um, we have targets around SACT rate and fit patients. Um, and uh, we have other um, QPI that you read there. So um, importantly, we have a QPI around reducing post-mortem examinations when it's not necessary. Uh, particularly in patients where there is a firm histological diagnosis, because it's clearly very distressing for patients um, and is in really quite costly. So for us, where we have to um, pass the bar of, of being cost effective, that's an important metric. Uh, and we've start, we're at our first look at the QPI, we've been through them all in the last few months and they will be published within the next few weeks. And this is really just six months of data. So it's really just getting a handle on some of the measurability issues and making sure we're getting data in rather than any conclusions at this time. So I want to just to very quickly run, just cover some of the other activities. So we have a website um, which is full of uh, information. Uh, the address is there at the top and I'll put it on my last slide as well. Um, you can go to the centres in, in Scotland, you can look at the doctors you're going to meet, you can see your CNS, you can find your CNS's contact details. If you're a patient, you can go and see what a biopsy involves, what a CT scan involves, what the treatments involve. Um, and then we have links to various events. Uh, we're also on Twitter uh, at scottreso.net. Uh, and that again is just awareness raising and highlighting various activities. Um, one of those activities is that we run a, a monthly support group, which is hosted by our fantastic colleagues in, in the Maggie Centre in Inverness. And so that is um, a fantastic resource for patients. Uh, it's attended by um, some of the CNSs. Uh, uh, on a kind of rotation, and then it's really an open forum for patients to connect. Um, we have a number of education elements. Um, uh, this was our agenda for this year's Education Day, which was in October. Um, you can download all the talks still, they're all available uh, on YouTube. Uh, so if you go to that link there, you can listen uh, to Lorraine talk about the Moore study, or you can hear about the GEM study or the MAG study, or you can hear Dean Fennell talking about trials, or you can hear about some of our uh, Mars 2 update or anything, anything you like, really. We've also got a, a, an event that's exclusively uh, tuned for patient and carers. Um, so this is not for clinicians to go and learn things, although clinicians will try and contribute on some of the treatment options. Um, uh, there'll be some of the research updates, but in a, in a format that's more appropriate for patients, more accessible. Um, we'll have some legal advice there. Uh, we'll have some breakout sessions on breathlessness and fatigue and mindfulness and even some Pilates. I suspect that might be Julie Roberts that's involved in that. Um, and so that's happening on the 29th of April, but these events are all on the website. Um, and so just to finish off, um, there's obviously been significant progress um, and we've, we've gone from a local service to a regional MDT to a national MDT and network. We've gone from none to seven specialist nurses, one of which is a plural nurse specialist, and we've got clinical leads in five cities. Um, we've got pretty robust systems for audit, but also Critically, we've got QPIs, which means that health boards will be held to standards. It's not just about us collecting data and then being upset when we haven't hit the targets. We actually have got um, some teeth with the QPI. Um, and we've got um, as equitable as we can make it access to clinical trials. And there are some complex issues around travel and things that do complicate trials. Um, we've got an education program and support groups and I haven't touched at all on our research program, but that is a very big part of what we do. Uh, and just a final slide, um, there are some challenges ahead and, and Paul's outlined, outlined some of the, the uncertainties around MDTs. And I think um, it is important that we 
Denning Street uh, that we can translate all of this infrastructure into some improved outcomes. Uh, clearly with treatments that now work, um, that is much more tangible. Um, for us, uh, we are now working on securing core NHS funding, uh, and hopefully that is moving forward quite positively. Um, combination immunotherapy in terms of its deployment, I think makes MDTs uh, more important, especially if, if the licensing ends up being around uh, non-resectable disease. Uh, I think we've all got a difficult challenge in terms of how we navigate the next two years um, in terms of surgery. Um, my own view is that it's really important that we acknowledge the uncertainty. Um, none of us know the results of, of the MARS-2 trial, um, but there are many areas in medicine where we don't have phase three randomized controlled trials. And um, what we do have in surgery is, is experienced centers. And we have phase two trials where we know that um, in highly selected epithelioid cases with stage one disease, N0, good PS, operations like chlorectomy decortication can be pretty safe and have outcomes that extend into many years. Uh, and I think we need to involve patients in that dis discussion. I think we need to avoid uh, being overly paternalistic uh, and, and saying that it's a too complex a discussion for them to have, uh, have a voice. Um, especially if they're not maybe going to get um, immediate access to immunotherapy. Uh, and it's a good thing that the trial landscape is complex, but it, but it, it does need some navigation. Um, and we need to, as we start to learn a bit about a regional variation in Scotland through our audit data, is engage with sites to help them change. And also we need to learn from our experiences. So I'll just say thank you to all the various members of the MDT. I think one or two might have dialed in and I hope I haven't forgot any names. I have a terrible habit of forgetting names. Um, I just highlight the carers and the patients and the families here that have driven a lot of this and made um, a lot of this possible and many of these are still engaged. Um, and I hope we've got some time for some questions. So I'll stop sharing. Lovely, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, and Paul, if you want to join us back again, so we we are we did we started five minutes late, so we've only got five minutes, and I think it's okay if we run over by a couple of minutes, if that's all right with everybody else. Um, excellent presentations. I think we saw from um, Paul's presentation that uh, you know they are MDTs are embedded in cancer practice, and um, whilst we haven't probably got huge um, you know hardened evidence to support them. Sometimes when it's a good thing, you, you kind of know instinctively and that evidence, you know, you're going to try and gather it for gathering its sake, I guess. Um, we've seen where we are with meso MDTs across the country, and then we've seen an absolute uh, flagship MDT and how you developed it. Um, so we've had quite a few questions come in. I think one thing I would say about Kevin as well, your presentation, um, uh, you know, the infrastructure that you put in place. Um, the, the amount of organic coordination, so the admin and clerical support and the, the project management support that it takes to get that quality infrastructure in place cannot be underestimated. And, you know, admin, just coordinating referrals from all those different hospitals, getting the scans and the information. And I, I absolutely always want to sing the praises of the NHS staff, uh, the admin staff working in our NHS, because they absolutely hold things together at the seams for us often. Um, and it, would, it couldn't happen without them, really. Um, and I think, you know, your presentation is, uh, is a credit to them, really, because they are they do hold a lot of that together, don't they, on a day to day basis. So some of the questions have come in. Chris has asked about immunotherapy. And Chris, I'm going to bounce that until next month because we've got Anna Nowak talking about chemo immunotherapy. And also we've got a, a, um, an interview going out with a patient who's on immunotherapy at the minute at the end of this week. And if you want to know anything on a personal level, please ring the free phone information line or drop us an email. Um, we had one lady who asked, um, Paul, probably this is for you. What is the main basic reason? If you could pick just one reason why we have MDTs, um, more, is it for the pay, benefit of patients, is it benefit of clinicians, but what's the one main uh, basic reason that they were established? Well, well, it's most certainly 
for the benefit of the, of the patient. Although, um, if you can create an environment where it's uh, more conducive to clinicians making good decisions, then that's obviously in the patient's interest. I, I think I think the main benefit really is um, uh, allowing uh, a range of opinions, a range of expert opinions, to come up with a. Uh, a range of options for patients and then to be able to deliver those to, to patients so they've got um, uh, the benefit of a, of a wide range of uh, uh, expertise and opinion. And if um, it, it, we, we, granted we feel it is essential, um, especially if MDTs for mesothelioma is another level, um, what can patients do to ensure that they have been discussed at meso-MDT and how can they get themselves discussed at meso-MDT? Uh, well, really, by raising it with their with their uh, the clinician that they're under or their specialist nurse, um, um, you, you would you would hope that um, uh, as we move forward, it would just become a routine thing. That there, there's no need to ask the question. But I think until we see that that move from fifty percent being being referred to one hundred percent, then uh, patients should feel quite comfortable to ask. Has my case been discussed at a specialist mesothelioma MDT? Where was it, and who, and and, and was it properly constituted? Um, uh, so yes, they feel uh, should feel empowered to ask that question. I think. Thank you. Um, there were some questions about patients and carers and how they were involved, Kevin. But I think you covered that at the end in your acknowledgement slide. And I think if people want to know more, if they if they can't if they haven't got your contact details, contact us, and we'll pose that question if they want to know more. But clearly, very involved in the development of the Scottish network, and still are very involved. Yes. Um, there, there was also some questions, Kevin, that came in about um, the QPIs um, and how um, and how they were developed. But you did go over those in quite a bit more detail, and also some questions about how you've audited and evaluated. Um, and I think you covered that really well. But again, in, just in the interest of time, I think if people want to know more detail about how you've audited and evaluated, you've got that report coming out in February, which might help. Um, but certainly somebody asked if there was any kind of uh, theory about uh, change theory that you used to evaluate. Um, and I'd say, generally speaking, in healthcare on a day to day basis, we don't use those kind of methods of evaluation, but we tend to use clinical audit uh, an awful lot. So I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Um, not really. I mean, just to say that the, the QPI essentially were generated based on the BTS guidelines. So they are essentially um, driven by the evidence. And then there was a national consultation pro pro program involving clinicians and patients, and uh, that's how they were developed. Um, yeah. Okay. And then um, in your presentation, you spoke about identifying on the pro forma that patients, there is no need for that person to have a post-mortem. And the question has come in, do the uh, procurer fiscals always adhere to your MDT decision? Um, I think we're finding no is the short answer. Um, I think, you know, the fiscal is actually um, an office with a bunch of um, people in it and some are more senior and some are more junior. And uh, I think the, the it's a bit like the junior doctor you speak to. It de depends on who you speak to on the day. I think there's still a... We meet with the fiscal quite a lot, who's the equivalent of the coroner in England. And so there's an educa a two-way education that needs to happen there. And the idea is that we would have a, uh, some documentation that would uh, be agreed at both ends so that um, when a, a, a diagnosis goes to the fiscal, there's a set number of simple criteria that are met uh, and the fiscal can then feel empowered to not default to Let's do a let's do a post mortem, which I think is 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 too often the, the reality. I mean, it just shows that, that you know it's just great that there's that closeness in working, and that it's only going to get better and evolve over a period of time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I wanted to just pick up on the Pilates. Um, just that a, a gentleman that I looked after for many years with mesothelioma, Graham Sherlock Brown, who's known to many people, was on the steering committee for mesothelioma UK absolute staunch advocate for Pilates. He had lots of problems with posture uh, when he was diagnosed with mesothelioma, rounding of his shoulders and said Pilates cured him of that and really helped with his breathlessness. So I'm a real advocate uh, for, for Pilates. Um, 
one last question I want to pose to both of you. I think what you've achieved in Scotland is phenomenal. There's been lots of in the chat about Wales and Sarah Morgan is leading our project in Wales and trying to replicate some of what you've achieved in Scotland. Um, in England, um, you know, it, it, it's a much bigger country and, um, you know, there are a lot more um, variations in incidents and so on. And I just wondered, it, it'd be great if we could have an MDT for each cancer alliance and a similar kind of hub and spoke. And Meso UK, um, you know, we're committed to developing MDTs. And if there was one thing we should do as a charity, what would you advise us to do to help establish um, more Meso MDTs across the UK? So, sorry, putting you on the spot, but one thing if we could, apart from putting money behind it, of course. <laughs> um, I guess I'll go first. I mean, I think across, the, if, outside Scotland, I think the NHS, I think, there's, there are advantages to be mined. You know, the commissioning structure of the NHS in England allows you to maybe attract, uh, you know, quality services and, and, and actually tariffs and things allow you to actually develop a MISO MDT in a way that we could never do in Scotland because we have to demonstrate um, cost savings or cost neutrality, um, which forces us to go down a quality thing. But I think there are maybe some levers in NHS England that could be pulled that are available that we don't have. And I think you guys should, should use them. So talking to commissioners, get in the conversation. Yeah, going. To commissioners, but involving, I mean, the patients need to be, you know, people, commissioners and MPs and budget holders will listen to patients much more than they'll listen to doctors or nurses. And so I think having patients' voices heard as being them valuing the, the, the development is really critical. So talking to commissioners, getting patients' voices heard. Paul? Yeah, I was going to say exactly that about the patient voice, because that came out very clearly in, in, in Kevin's slide of, of the timeline, where actually it was it was the fact that patients were starting to realise this was something that they should be having access to that, that really triggered off all, all the rest of the things that came down to people. So, uh, you know, as, as you asked uh, earlier, Liz, uh, I think if mesothelioma in the UK can, can continue to publicise to the to the patient community and to the clinical community as well, of course, but to the patient community, that's something they should be expecting and asking for uh, and demanding. I think that will drive the development. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Just as all cancer patients should, and meso shouldn't be any different, I guess. So um, there's lots in the chat about excellent presentations. Thank you, both speakers. Um, and love to hear the recognition of the importance of patients and carers in the third sector and so on. So thank you both very much, gentlemen. Um, uh, excellent presentation. And, um, you know, as I said, Miso UK is committed to the ongoing development of MDTs and supporting the work that's going on in Scotland and now uh, in Wales. And hopefully we'll get to Ireland when we can get a footprint into Ireland as well. Um, our next um, uh, Miso Matters webinar, as I said, is on the 29th of March at lunchtime because it's with an uh, Australian speaker, Anna Nowak, talking about uh, latest update on chemo immunotherapy. Um, so please don't miss that. We'd love to hear your evaluations, please. You will get on Eventbrite the chance to complete an evaluation and um, we'd be very grateful for your comments. Thank you to everybody that joined us, but particularly thank you to Faye and Julie who have been in the background. Um, and to Kevin and Paul, our two speakers. Thank you both very much. Stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye.